I'm a manly man. I have 15 children. That doesn't, that's not the way people think anymore. We used to size up a man by counting his children. Now we count Rolex watches, six pack abs, and Twitter followers. Uh, and I'm supposed to talk about the economy. And it's all about odds, right? It's all about probabilities. And I mentioned my mother was a third grade teacher. She once told me a story about a first grade teacher who asked her students to come to the front of the classroom and to spell for them what their parents do for a living. So first little Jimmy walks to the front of the room. He says, hi, my name is Jimmy. My dad is a cook that's spelled C-O-O-K. Uh, and if dad were here today, he'd give all of you a hamburger. Uh, then uh, Kendra walks to the front of the room. She says, hi, my name is Kendra. Uh, my mom is a baker. That's spelled B-A-K-E-R. Uh, and if she were here today, she'd give all of you a chocolate chip cookie. Lillianne struts to the front of the room. My name is Lillianne. My mother is an anthropologist. That's spelled A-N-T-P, no, A-S-T, finally. The teacher says, Lillianne, why don't you sit down, collect your thoughts, and then you'll come up. And so, all right, Chucky struts up. My name's Chucky. My dad's a Vegas bookie. That's spelled B-O-O-K-I-E. And if dad were here today, he'd give you 10 to 1. She ain't ever going to spell anthropologist. So I'll give you 10 to 1. You're not going to find any economist, including Janet Yellen, the head of the Federal Reserve Board, who's going to know exactly what's going on in the economy. But I'm going to try today. And I've got a challenging task. And I'm actually delighted to be here because, you know, as, as you probably surmise, I give a lot of talks all around the world. This year I've been to Abu Dhabi and Dubai and, and Thailand and, and New York and Cleveland and Philadelphia and various places, trying to figure out what's happening. And it is a very challenging time, but actually my message is going to be uplifting because I think the world economy is somehow stitching itself back together and is stronger than it's been in about 10 years. And I hope many of you are seeing that uh, in the localities and cities uh, that you work in and represent and looking for, uh, looking to place your next, your next meeting. So, but we do live in this odd time where anything can happen. Brexit was not supposed to happen. That image, we are ready, that's from Catalonia, from Spain, which is wondering whether it's going to be declaring independence from Spain at this very moment. We are ready. Are, are you ready? Am I ready? Are we ready to face this world with all the complexity and all of the changes? I guess you can think of my presentation in three parts. Part number one is, all this big picture confusing stuff. What in the world is going on in the world? How do you make sense of all these changes and all this dynamic stuff? Part number two is, more specifically, what's happening in the economy? What's happening with energy prices? What's happening with interest rates? These sorts of things are, are very important uh, to, the, to the convention and meeting industry. If oil prices skyrocket, then airline prices skyrocket. If interest rates go up, it's tougher for people to borrow and companies to borrow and invest and so on. And part number three, we got to grapple with the political situation in the US and elsewhere and talk about leadership in this challenging time. So first of all, what, what's going on? Well, this slide for me reminds me of what a complex era we live in. Now, there's, I, I told you, I, I grew up on the East Coast. I live in California now. There's my governor, my former governor, Arnold Schwarzenegger. There he is filling up his GM Hummer. Now, because he married a Kennedy, Arnie's got a hybrid Hummer. So, you know, he gets like five, six miles a gallon on that baby. Uh, on the right, I've got Hot Wheels cars. In fact, I went to Target the other day, I bought myself a new Hot Wheels car, bright yellow car. Now, what is this to scale compared to a, a real vehicle? One to, I need someone to make a guess. Would, uh, sir, would you just take a guess? Two digit number. Bet between 63 and 65. <laughs> 63, well, let's go with 64, okay. Do you realize in a symbol of how the world economy turned upside down right before our eyes, a few years ago, suddenly the market capitalization, the value of all the shares of General Motors shrunk to less than the value of the Hot Wheels cars. Yeah, Hot Wheels could have bought GM. Really? Why are you snickering? You're an American taxpayer. You bought GM. Are you from the States? 
Yeah, you bought GM. We all bailed out GM. With Canadians, any Canadians in the house? You did too, right? We never imagined we'd live in a world where the toys would be worth more than the actual vehicles. But this is what we're dealing with. We live in this era of hyper competition where speed is of the essence. The very moment Janet Yellen at the Federal Reserve Board or Mario Draghi, the head of the European Central Bank, the moment they turn on their microphone, I grab hold of my wallet. Really, because I know all it takes is one statement and suddenly the stock market can go up, stock market can go down, and it happens instantaneously. We live in, I call it the age of anxiety. Anyone know what movie, the upper left photo there, what movie is that from? Anyone know? Network. Who said that? One of the greatest movies ever made. The most prescient, far-seeing movie ever made. If you haven't seen this movie since it came out in 1976, you're old. I mean, let's face it, but really. But you need to watch it. I watched this movie with my kids uh, back uh, last fall, a year ago. Now, I, I'll tell you what it's about. That guy in the upper left, he's a broadcaster, a newscaster. It takes place in the 1970s, and he's basically going crazy. He's become an alcoholic. He's frustrated because corporations have taken over the newsroom. He's worried about so-called fake news. This is 1976. There, there's the oil embargo from OPEC, so oil prices are high, inflation is high, unemployment is high, and basically he's a mess. And one evening, at the end of his broadcast, he goes on TV and he tells the American people, he says, tune in next Tuesday, because I'm gonna shoot on the air. Well, at that moment, backstage in the movie, they show you all the producers and directors, and they're all saying, turn off his microphone, turn off his microphone, turn off the ca One producer in this movie, who foresaw reality television, steps forward and says, no, 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 let him go on, let him go on. Think about the ratings we're gonna get next Tuesday. So he goes on the air next Tuesday, and now he's just foaming at the mouth. And he goes right up to the camera, and he says to the people, I want you to open up your window and scream out to your neighbor, I'm mad as hell and I'm not gonna take it anymore. And then in the movie, they pan down, I don't know, Third Avenue in New York, you see some guy, some white guy opens up his window and screams, I'm mad as hell, I'm not gonna take it anymore. Some African American across the street opens up his window and screams, I'm mad as hell, I'm not gonna take it anymore. A Chinese guy yells, I'm mad. I watched this with my kids one year ago and I said, there it goes, Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. <laughs> really, two characters a billionaire and a socialist, and they both were saying the exact same thing. The system is corrupt, and I'm gonna make it better. Why, why, why all this division, the fractured society? I mean, to be honest, I am almost walking on eggshells on this Sands Theater stage because I find that it's so difficult to have a conversation that touches on politics without people being offended. We've got to be so careful. I was at a dinner party the other night. Suddenly people started talking about politics and it got really heated. And finally, you know, I called over the waiter and I said, can you tell us the specials again? You know, is there avocado or feta on the salad? Just to interrupt. So what is the source of this anxiety? Well, here's a paradox. In many cases, the source is good news. And I'll explain, and you guys are a smart group so I can explain these paradoxes. Look at the photo on the upper right, 1989, the Berlin Wall comes crashing down, the March of Freedom. President Reagan had demanded, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. The wall came down. I was serving in the White House in 89 when the wall came down. I could talk to you about the politics, the politics of Poland and Berlin, but MPI and, and Tim in Philadelphia didn't ask me to come here today to talk about the Berlin Wall. What does the Berlin Wall, 5,000 miles away from Las Vegas, have to do with talking about the economy and anxiety? For every square foot of Berlin Wall cement that crumbled to the ground as dust, hundreds and hundreds of workers who've been trapped behind that wall, trapped under communism, were suddenly free. Were free to do what? Free to vote, free to travel, free to start a newspaper, but also free to compete. Who do they compete against? Are you, against you, against me, against somebody writing software code in Toronto or assembling textiles in Mexico? One reason why 
the economic models of the Federal Reserve Board and Harvard and MIT and Oxford and Cambridge haven't done a bit of good in 25 years when you introduce hundreds of millions of workers into the worldwide workforce and then you open up India and China and a billion new workers come out, what does it do? It does two things. It creates prosperity in places that were terribly poor. Hundreds of millions of people have been lifted out of abject poverty and starvation in India, China, and Eastern Europe. But at the same time, for middle class families in Western Europe, US, Canada, Japan, it slams down labor rates, creates a kind of competition. And that means that while prosperity is spread across many parts of the world that were terribly poor, Many of our friends and neighbors stay up late at night at the kitchen table wondering, how am I going to pay my bills? And then on top of that, we've had merger and acquisition booms, which can make companies more efficient. But if your company's just been taken over, do you have job security? Or are they going to talk about, oh, we're going to figure out how to become leaner and meaner, which means a pink slip? These mergers tend to come in waves. I remember, I think it was 1998, turned on CNN, and I was shocked to hear that Daimler, Benz, and Chrysler, two companies that had made tanks that fought each other in World War II, were merging. Now, we all, those of us from North America, grew up with the idea of the big three in Detroit. The big three in, whoa, that phrase doesn't make any sense anymore, the big three. There's a story about the Daimler-Benz executive in Stuttgart, Germany. The merger was announced. He calls together his staff in a big conference room. He's got flip charts and handouts. handouts. Finally, the guy in the back raises his hand. He says, boss, OK, I understand who I report to, what my division does. What I don't understand is in German. How do you pronounce Daimler-Benz, Chrysler, Plymouth? Well, he, he stumbled over the word Plymouth. With a Daimler executive at the podium, he couldn't say Plymouth either. Finally, he throws up his hands and he says, it's pronounced Daimler-Benz. The Chrysler is silent. <laughs> Pretty much the way that one worked out. Uh, but Chrysler is now in the hands of Fiat and is actually the best part of Fiat, or uh, the highest performing part of Fiat. My point is, there's a paradox here. The Berlin Wall falls. India, China open up. Eastern Europe opens up. Companies become more efficient. It raises the overall standard of living in the world, but it creates a lot of anxiety especially among middle-income people. Um, OK, next slide here. We may have a little, there we are. Oh, by the way, I took this from my daughter's high school history textbook. If your kids ever ask you about Marco Polo, here's what you need to know. Silk routes, spice routes between the edges of Europe, there's Constantinople on the left, uh, and, and China. What were they trading then? I, I apologize, it's a little fuzzy for you to see, so I'll tell you. They were trading dates, figs, prunes. <clears throat> <laughs> Breakfast for old people. You know, that, that's what Marco Polo is about. Bre now what is it? It's the financial flows. It's the energy flows. And it's no surprise then that given this age of anxiety that in the U.S. political campaign that Donald Trump turned the so-called Rust Belt red. States that were reliably union and democratic, which... Hillary Clinton didn't even campaign in because she thought she had a lock on it, and they ended up voting for Donald Trump because this world is so confusing and creates such anxiety among voters. Now, the downside of this age of anxiety is we are now at the point that there's a kind of backlash in the world against free trade. Countries are worried that, well, if, somebody, if we buy stuff from abroad, it takes away our jobs here, and so what do we have? We've got Democrats and Republicans in the U.S. trying to renegotiate NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. President Trump has picked a couple fights with Can Canadian lumberjacks and, and milk farmers, India keeping out U.S. steel. All sorts of things are going on, which make it really more difficult to have a synchronized global economic recovery. And I think you know, all of us uh, at this meeting are interested in being able to visit other countries and do business with other places. And so this is something, this, this age of anxiety has led to this caution in terms of international affairs. OK, some big structural issues that countries are going to have to deal with. Debt and demographics. 
I study demographics very intently. My book, The Price of Prosperity, I talk about demographics. And there's a relationship to, the, to debt levels in various countries. This chart here, um, the, the horizontal line, I don't think I've got a, um, a light here, do I? Yeah, here we are. That's a little one. All right. Uh, the horizontal line here is debt as a percentage of the economy. Uh, the vertical line, the y-axis, is the deficit. The only thing you need to know is it's dangerous in the southeast quadrant of the map when you look at debt and deficits. Who's there? Greece, Spain, Portugal, the US, the Eurozone. Now, look at this. Who's in the enviable northwest quadrant with low debt and low deficit? Mexico. Mexico. That's a surprise. You know the way Sarah Palin said that she knows a lot about foreign policy because she lives in Alaska and she can see Russia from her house? <laughs> I live in San Diego. I can see Mexico from my house. I have to wait for Shamu the whale at SeaWorld to get the hell out of the way after he does his swirls, but then I can see Mexico. This has political implications. Who else is up there? Russia. Russia. This, why do you think Vladimir Putin could take off his shirt and strut bare-chested through Crimea? Because he wasn't worried about borrowing on the international bond market. Now, I have to tell you, in the last couple of years, the Russian economy's gotten rocky or not quite as strong. So now if you see Putin without a shirt, <laughs> he had to sell it at the flea market. Um, but there's a political implication to countries and the debt that they have. Now, how did the, the, how did the US get into a debt problem here? Before President Obama, before the Great Recession, about a third of US taxpayers paid no federal income tax. Snoopy is here. Thanksgiving is coming up in the States and in Canada. I've got a question. Can any of the Americans in this room trace their ancestors to the Mayflower? Raise your hand if you can do that. Usually if you get like 200, 300 Americans in a room, you can get a hand up. Okay, so let's, oh there is. Oh wow, all the way in the back and two in the back. Boy, I, you know, I would have thought the Mayflower descendants would be up front. So um, all the way in the back, can you shout the name of the family that came over? Hayworth. Hayworth? Okay, got it. So let's, let's do a little thought experiment. We're all coming over on the Mayflower. It's stormy, it's rocky. The North Atlantic is, is, is some of us are sick to our stomach, but we're gonna go below deck because we're gonna have a meeting. Because we gotta come up with a couple basic principles on how we're gonna run this new community. At that point, would any of us step forward and say, well, one third to one half of us should not have to pay any taxes? Wouldn't that immediately undermine the new community? Yeah. Anyone here belong to a book club? Oh, come on, I got a lot of books to sell. I, oh, good. Can you imagine you have a book club and half the people say, I'm not gonna buy the book, I'm not gonna read the book. But I'll be at your house next Tuesday and I want lobster tails, lamb chops, and fine what You couldn't have a book club. Can you have a country? I think we're gonna be answering that question in the, in, in the US and Canada and Western Europe and in Japan over the next 10 to 15 years. Now, how do we get in this mess? Blame my wife's grandparents. These are my wife's grandparents. By the way, Tim, from Philadelphia, Rittenhouse Square, from Philadelphia, my wife's grandparents. In this photo, a year ago, Valentine's Day, 2016, they were honored as the longest married couple in America. My wife's grandparents, Maury and Helen. He was 102, she was 101. Yeah, they were married over 81 years. Amazing, yeah. Yeah, his third marriage. You know, I don't know how he fit that in. <laughs> no, but it is true, they were on over 81 years. It's fantastic. Life expectancy has rocketed. It's wonderful to see what, how, how agile, how, how, how active people can be. I mean, we see it in the sports world at a, at a less, lesser level. Tom Brady, star quarterback, 40 years old. Uh, in, this, in this city, Floyd Mayweather won the boxing match against uh, McGregor. Uh, a month or so ago, 40 years old, people are living longer, it's a fantastic thing. But if you're trying to balance the books for the government with social security and pensions, it puts some pressure on, right? As people are living longer and living, uh, having a retirement that lasts 20, 30, could be 40 or 50 years, it's wonderful. Something else happens that's challenging for government budgets. This is 
the story of human history. When countries move from poor status to middle class status, there are two things that happen. First, they buy iPhones. The second thing they do throughout history, they have fewer children. When this goes back to ancient Rome. When people no are no longer poor, why? Because poor people need children to crawl on their bellies into the coal mine, to work in the agricultural fields. But wealthier countries don't need that. People have fewer children. And also, traditional peasant, so-called peasant society, what sociologists and anthropologists call peasant societies, the number of children equated to your stature. I'm a manly man. I have 15 children. Right? That does, that's not the way people think anymore. We used to size up a man by counting his children. Now we count Rolex watches, six-pack abs, and Twitter followers. This also makes it tougher to balance the books for pension plans. Do you realize in the States, we have, literally, we have more golf courses than McDonald's. Yeah. Japan used to provide a silver chalice for anyone who turned age 100. But so many people in Japan have turned age 100 that they no longer provide this. It would be too expensive for the government to do that. In Japan, now, now, now get this, they sell more adult diapers than baby diapers. And look at her, she's very pleased. You know, we're not sure what, um, okay. Franklin Roosevelt, great president of the United States was honest and smart. He set up the social security system in the 1930s. He set the retirement age at 65. Why? Because in the 1930s, the average 65 year old was anyone else? dead, dead. Yeah. You know, Franklin Roosevelt did not even live to age 65 himself. Look at the chart in the upper right. Um, in the 1940s, social security, you had about 40 workers for every retiree. So this whole part of the room here, you guys would work full time, take a little bit from your paycheck and give it to one person in retirement. You wouldn't even notice it. By the 1950s, you have 15 full-time workers take a tiny bit from their paycheck, give it to one person in retirement. Now we're getting to the point in the US uh, and other G7 countries where it's just about two workers for one in retirement. The numbers don't work. I want you to picture Lyndon Johnson, US President Lyndon Johnson, 1960s. I've got a photo of him coming up here. Let's get LBJ, there he is. He sets up Medicare the health care program for elderly people. The retirement age, Lyndon Johnson sets at 65. Look at that photo. Think about life expectancy. Do you realize Lyndon Johnson did not live to see age 65? That's his senior prom. He was 18 years old when that photo was taken. <laughs> the numbers just don't work. The numbers, just, now I had an idea the other day. I don't know if I'd get many votes for this to try to reform things. How about this? Maybe you'll all join me. Let's have a nationwide, no, a worldwide campaign. Let's drive down life expectancy. Yeah, yeah. no more bicycle helmets, no more motorcycle helmets, no more guardrails on twisty mountain, mountainous roads. Take out the guardrail by grandma's bathtub. Let's march on the stockyards of Chicago and let's stop the senseless inspection of meat. Don't, you let me know if, any of your respective representatives, wherever you live, have a more serious idea than that. Okay, um, so, th so far, it sounded pretty gloomy, right? I'm talking about trade tensions, countries being envious of each other, anxiety, debt levels, and yet the stock market's doing great. How can, I, how can that be explained? Well, look. President Obama came into office, and it was as, as if he were on a tank with a turret that spun 360. And one by one, he looked at different industries. And he said, insurance industry, you're just going to cheat people. Oil, gas, coal, you're going to pollute. Healthcare, you're not going to pay people's bills. Chemicals, you pollute. Finance, you're cheating people. Manufacturing hotels and restaurants, you're just exploiting minimum wage workers. By the time you finished, Outside of green energy, nearly every sector worried that it was going to face new taxes and regulations. So Donald Trump comes into office. Every president has enemies. Do uh, Richard Nixon famously had a list of specific names of individuals. And nowadays, people, you know, older people who are around in the 70s are proud. Oh, I was on Nixon's enemies list. Well, so Obama had 
in industry sector enemies. Donald Trump has enemies. High taxes, regulations, Chinese dumping goods, Mexico exporting people and goods, the mainstream media. The difference here is that Trump's enemies aren't sectors of the economy. And the stock market kind of likes that switch. Okay, so what's going on? I told you part one is big picture stuff. Part two is, all right, where's the economy at the moment? Here's my metaphor. 2012, the US Olympic track teams, the relay teams, both the men's and women's relay, dropped the baton. If you ever run track, it makes a terrible noise. It's just a little ping, but that's a terrible noise if you're doing a relay race. So, the US economy and, a, and certain parts of the world economy, up until 2015, were being driven by oil and gas and fracking, and, that, and it helped Oklahoma, Texas, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and then oil prices collapsed in mid-2014, and every economist I know showed up on Bloomberg and Reuters and the BBC and said the same thing. Oh, oil prices have fallen. This is fantastic. The consumers are going to come out and spend money and spend money, and 2015 is going to be a blockbuster year. 2016 spending, the malls are going to be packed, and nothing happened. The consumer just looked at the baton and said, I'm not going to touch that. And we kind of been waiting for somebody to pick up that baton. So what are the three critical things to look at as you analyze not just the US economy, but the European economy, Asian economy, South American economy, three critical levers. Number one, rates, interest rates. Number two, oil prices. Number three, trade. All right, start with interest rates. Interest rates are nearly zero all over the world. I'll show you a chart like that. A lot of my friends who thought this was a disastrous policy of the Federal Reserve Board and other central banks, they told me by now we'd have hyperinflation. I don't know. I don't see hyperinflation. They told me the dollar, U.S. dollar, was going to fritter away to nothing. I don't think so. In fact, it's harder for foreign tourists to come to the States because the U.S. dollar has been strong. All right, so the Fed has tried to lift up the economy with basically 0% interest rates. The price of oil, this is good news. The price of oil is in a lovely range, meaning that oil prices, world oil prices, at roughly $50 a barrel are just high enough that exploration and oil companies can make a profit, but low enough that consumers can afford to fill up their tank when they go to the gas station. So that's good news for the economy. Low interest rates are good news for the economy. The question mark now is trade and these trade tensions. And is there going to be a trade war uh, between various countries? Uh, and what is the White House view on that? I told you every central bank in the world has cut interest rates to zero. Upper left is Europe, Bank of England on the right, Royal Bank of Australia, Canada, Bank of Japan, everywhere. A lot of my friends who thought this was going to be a disaster told me, Todd, it's going to take us back to the 70s. If you don't remember the 70s, upper left, Jimmy Carter. Lower left, remember Jimmy had a singing group, the village people, right? Stagflation. Inflation combined with a recession that just wouldn't end. Well, I'm sorry, I don't think inflation is baked in the cake. Uh, prices all around, the prices seem pretty quiet. Now, look, I got a kid in college, I could raise my hand and say, Todd, you boob, look at my tuition bill. I know. But when you compare prices across the board, it's pretty darn quiet. In fact, there are price wars that are still breaking out. Target and Walmart are in a price war. Fidelity and Schwab, Amazon bought Whole Foods. Do you know how, you know why Amazon bought Whole Foods, how that worked out? Jeff Bezos, who's the founder and CEO of, of Amazon, was at his home and he has that Alexa Echo thing where he can order a pizza and so on. And, and, and he just wanted to order something from Whole Foods and Alexa bought the whole damn company. Um, <laughs> Why is inflation staying quiet? One reason is the so-called gig economy. Airbnb has effectively added 25% to the number of hotel rooms in major cities. I mean, this obviously has an impact uh, on your business. On the one hand, if you're running a hotel, it makes it tougher to raise prices and make profits. On the other hand, if you're hosting the convention or looking for accommodations, it's really done wondrous things to keep hotel prices uh, under lid. In fact, I have to tell you, I was staying 
Why is the Abercrombie dude lonely? I'll tell you in a couple minutes. Uh, I was in New York last year, and I stayed at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. Look at this. You can't see it, so I'll tell you. $229 a night. The Waldorf. That's where the emirs stay. That's where the Prince of Egypt stays. Or at least, <laughs> was it Jake Gyllenhaal who played the Prince of Egypt? Whoever. The, that's where the president stay. $200. Why was I there? Because competition drove down prices, and also the U.S. dollar has been very strong. This is a chart of the U.S. dollar against major currencies. Now, it's dipped a little bit this, this year, but basically it's very strong. This means it's been tougher for non-U.S. tourists to come to New York City. That's why the Abercrombie dude is lonely. The Abercrombie, for years, there's been a half-naked dude right outside across the street from Trump Tower. How many of you have been to Trump Tower? On Fifth Avenue and 55th Street, across the street, is the Abercrombie and Fitch store. For years, there's been a half-naked guy standing in front. He's not homeless. He, no, he's a model. He, 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 and and there have been tourists lined up to take photos with the half-naked guy. And he's a lonely boy today because it's been tougher with the stronger dollar for people to afford it. The Russian, it's been tougher for Russian tourists. I, anyone know what movie it is on the, uh, the upper right? If you knew Network, you'll know this one. Anyone know this one? Rocky, which one? Four, Rocky Four, Drago, Dolph Lundgren was the actor. Now, you have not seen Dolph Lundgren in about 12 years, right? I'll, I'll, that's right, I'll tell you why. Well, I, I feel guilty because I destroyed his career. <laughs> I was staying at the Lowe's Santa Monica Hotel uh, in, uh, in Los Angeles, uh, and I woke up early one morning, I went to the gym. Now, if you haven't seen Rocky Four, Drago is like six foot four, 250 pounds. He says to Rocky, I will kill you. Like, you know, an and almost an android. So I go to the gym, and who's at the gym but Drago, Dolph Lundgren. So I grunt to him. We don't know each other, so I'm like, hey, how you doing? He's looking at me, hey, how you doing? All right. So I decided to have some fun with Drago, Rocky IV. So I'm doing the weight machines, but I'm a little bit ahead of him on the circuit. So I'm doing one of the bench presses, and then I thought I'll have some fun. When I'm done, I take the peg, and I put it at the heaviest weight. So Drago comes lumbering over, gets on the bench press, and he's like, oh, oh, Drago can't do this. And he had to lower and lighten the weight. And it so destroyed his ego, the guy hasn't been in a movie in 12 years. So I feel bad about that. Uh, OK. Um, oh, this slide. Uh, I told my wife I cannot use this, or my friends at MPI and from around the world are going to hate me and think I'm the biggest egotist. So I was on TV when oil prices were $100 a barrel. Um, and um, Maria Bartiromo, some of you may know the name. She's probably the most famous financial broadcaster. Uh, Maria says to me, Todd, what's going to happen to the price of oil? It's $100 a barrel. I said, Maria, it's going to collapse to 50 or below. And they put that in the headline there, oil headed for 50, Todd Buckholzer. So I told my wife, if I use this slide, you're all going to think that I'm the biggest bragger. She said, no, read this note, which she hand wrote for me, um, and that you might forgive me. Um, so let me just find mine. Yeah, OK. So uh, I, Todd Buckholz, did correctly forecast <clears throat> the collapse in the price of energy. Um, but around our house, I get everything wrong. Um, so there, I hope you forgive me, because uh, my wife and kids never do. Um, all right. So the US economy has been picking up a little steam. And the good news is the European economy is finally perking up. Now, we're not, not going to go deep into the data here. But um, this is uh, Germany expectations are up sharply in the last couple of months. This is manufacturing September compared to August in Europe, especially Germany, but also across the EMU, we've got stronger growth. So we're actually getting an upswing in the world economy. And here's the key question from an economist's point of view. Can we do that with inflation not taking off? Because if inflation takes off, then all the central banks have to slam on the brake, raise interest rates, and we could tumble back into a recession. My best bet is that we can handle stronger growth without creating inflation. Because the competition and the gig economy are such powerful forces. Um, so what do stocks, what's the stock market need in order to keep growing? Well, they need China and the EU to keep growing. North Korea, what we need there, the market, and I don't mean politically, but people who trade stocks, they're kind of jaded by fears of North Korea. They've kind of gotten used to it. 
bank spreads widen, what does that mean? Banks make money when they borrow at low rates and lend at higher rates. In other words, they can go to the Federal Reserve Board and say, hey, we'll, take, we'll borrow at 1% and then we'll lend the money at 4%. That's called the spread. And so bank spreads have widened some. Inflation's staying low. Retail is not dying. Takeovers, that's good for the stock market. And it's very important that Donald Trump not put up a wall. I'm not talking about immigration, but it's very important that we don't say we're going to have across the board tariffs of 25% on imported goods uh, from Asia or from uh, Central and South America. So has the stock market just been with this big gamble? I don't really think so. A couple reasons. First, there's an expectation there may be a tax cut coming out of Washington, D.C. Secondly, corporations have done an extraordinary job, and many of you are part of this, squeezing fat and corporate earnings have been up. 75% of corporations have beaten expectations. Earnings are up about 12% year over year. And also, because interest rates are so low, where else are you going to put your money? In our parents' or grandparents' day, you could take cash and stuff it into your mattress. But now everyone's got these darn Tempur-Pedic foam mattresses. You can't stuff cash into the foam. So it goes into the stock market. OK. By the way, all of us, no matter what we're doing, what angle of the business we're in, the millennials are changing everything. This is a more demographic change, but it affects earnings as well. When I was in college, 70% of us drank beer. Now the number's gone down to 40%. Liquor has become more popular. When I was a kid, everybody in my graduating high school class got his or her driver's license. <clears throat> well, except Linda Pisniak. Anyone know Linda? She, she just, Linda just never felt comfortable, so we used to drive, take turns driving Linda around. Now, look, uh, only 60% of 65% are getting driver's licenses. By the way, I have a daughter who's going to be turning 16. She said to me the other day, she said, Dad, what kind of car are you going to get me when I turn 16? I said, Alexia, I'm going to get you an Uber. Here, give me your phone. I'm going to download it now. Um, shopping. I mean, I don't know about you, but I see every day I seem to have Amazon boxes you know, in front of my door. And my daughter has trained our dog to, to carefully open up the boxes without ripping what's inside, which is terrific. If we could just get her to figure out how to do the labels to send things back when they don't fit. Um, but millennials are important to all this, and the demographics are important. And what about leadership? What about leadership? I'm not here to make a political speech. It's very easy to, for folks to portray the president as narcissistic, as unstable and so on. But you know, here's what I take from this photo. Two things. First of all, he knows there's a photographer there. We all would know and we would kind of pose. But he didn't take his arm and sweep everything off the desk. It's a working desk. He wants to get things done. He's got a view of Central Park. This is Trump Tower. Now think about this. Are, is there a more challenging business project than to build a skyscraper on the corner of Fifth Avenue and 56th Street in Manhattan. You've got to get approvals from the Landmarks Commission, the Mayor's Office, the Architectural Commission, the Plumbers Union, the Electricians Union, the Anchor Tenants, Bonwit Teller and Saks Fifth Avenue. Heck, if you're going to build a skyscraper in New York, you need cement. You've got to go to Tony Soprano and the mob to get the cement. You even have to negotiate with the mafia. So. So I think we need those who want to kind of disregard the president uh, and write him off as someone who's not going to get things done. I think that underestimates what his history has been. So he's got a new tax plan. I don't have a lot of time to spend on this, but wants to cut business taxes, expensing right off the purchase of equipment, personal income tax. Right now, it's not going anywhere fast in Congress, nor is repealing Obamacare going fast in Congress, nor are tariffs in Me on Mexico and China going fast in Congress. There's a bit of a stalemate everywhere. Uh, the president is in, I call it, a tax box. Here's the problem. He wants to cut taxes. That means the Treasury will take in less revenue in the short term. In the long term, it could lead to more growth and more revenue. In the short term, it loses revenue. But where's that money? How do you offset that? The first idea is repeal Obamacare. 
That was supposed to save a trillion dollars, but Congress would not pass the repeal. Then the idea was a border adjustment tax, tariffs across the board. That failed. So the challenge the president and the Republicans have right now is how do we find money so we can cut taxes without the deficit getting bigger? And that chart I showed you earlier looking more severe. Um, key players here. This, these photos are from Trump Tower. Steve Mnuchin, our Treasury Secretary. He's coming down the escalator. How many of you, well, I already asked about Trump Tower. Uh, this is the escalator. Go into Trump Tower, you may see Steve Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary. You may see Gary Cohn, the head of the National Economic Council, same escalator. You may see me, there I am, I've got an ice cream cone. It was a mint chip ice cream cone, because there's a really good ice cream place at the lobby of Trump Tower. Um, Steve Bannon is gone. Uh, now this guy is interesting. Those of you who might worry, is the U.S. going to put up barriers to other countries and so on? If you hear the name Wilbur Ross, that means there's more likely that there'll be tariffs and trade wars. Wilbur Ross is kind of an old-fashioned guy, a billionaire several times over who made his money in oil and gas and steel. He doesn't care about tech stuff. That's not interesting to him. Now, I have to tell you, if I were a billionaire several times over, and I were 80 years old, uh, and the Commerce Secretary, I don't think I'd need a nameplate in front of my desk telling me where I needed to sit. But Wilbur Ross does that. Um, why does he care about the so-called old economy? Why isn't he all about tech? Fang, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google. Why doesn't he not? Because he doesn't think the jobs are really there. Because he looked at Twitter. Twitter announced it was laying off 8% of its workforce. Right? Now, if Ford Motor Company laid off 8% of the workforce, there'd be tens of thousands of people unemployed. Twitter laid off 8% of its workforce. So how many people were unemployed? Uh, the Associated Press reports that the social media company announced 336 layoffs. So Wilbur Ross says, I don't care about this tech stuff. You can make a billion dollar tech company with a couple swivel chairs and a single serve coffee maker. You know, so he's the guy who cares about the old industry. All right, um, I'm gonna skip a couple slides here. Uh, foreign policy is fraught. You turn on the TV and you see rockets. Is this Venezuela? Uh, is, is this Syria? Is it Sudan? Where's this coming from? It's a challenging time on foreign policy as well. Um, and as we all struggle to make sense of things, I think one of the most important factors or questions is, who are your partners? Who are you doing business with? Who are you trusting? Who are you getting advice from? One of my, I wrote a book called New Ideas from Dead CEOs, and one of the heroes in it was Ray Kroc, who created McDonald's. Well, actually, you know what? He didn't create McDonald's. He didn't come up with the idea of hamburgers or a nationwide fast food franchise or franchise. He didn't come up with McDonald's. He bought the idea from the McDonald's brother. But McDonald's prevailed and beat out all the competition. Why? Because it was the partners that Ray Kroc chose and how he treated his partners. Other companies at that time in the 1950s would find a franchisee and say, here, sign this. Well, what's that? That's the expensive ovens, the expensive oils, the expensive uniforms. Ray Kroc brought in franchisees and said, you will become rich before I become rich. And he negotiated for them the best possible prices, and there were McDonald's franchisee millionaires before Ray Kroc became a millionaire. Now, why do I have a, a donut here? Because Krispy Kreme Donut missed that lesson. Some of you may have invested in that stock. It went way up, and then it was smashed like a jelly donut stomped on because the home office squeezed the franchisees. They sold them all sorts of expensive stuff. You could buy a Krispy Kreme donut at the, fill at the Chevron across the street from the Exxon or the Bonds or the Ralphs or the Safeway, cannibalizing sales. So finally, Krispy Kreme had to give back money to the franchisees. My point is it's how you treat your partners and how you choose your partners, which is why events like this and MPI and the IMEX meeting is so important because you can find the people that you can not just do business with, but get advice from. Because in the end, that's going to make the difference between your being able to perform your job at the highest possible level and serve your clients uh, as best possible. OK, um, last point here. Sometimes I'm asked, Todd, what is the most important economic and financial issue? The most important economic and financial issue is education. 
We are in a worldwide race for IQ points. Whatever country you live in, whatever city, whatever town, whoever harnesses intelligence will prosper most in this 21st century. In the 1990s, the US created 20 million net new jobs, but we lost jobs. Timber workers and farmers and typesetters. We gained jobs, engineering, science, legal assistant, financial services, architects. We've got, in the States, and in certain parts of Western Europe and across the world, high school dropout rates in certain counties of 40%. If you don't have at least a high school education in this worldwide competitive economy, you are competing against the last peasant in Mongolia who yoked a yak to a plow. Probably competing against that yak. And I search Google images, I can't tell you how many hours to find a good looking yak to bring with me to Las Vegas. So, Here's my, here's my message, and this is not imparting wisdom. I am begging of you. Wherever you live, I don't care if you live in Timbuktu or Tallahassee, you need to help kids in the schools. Tim, when he introduced me, and mentioned my work in, in mathematics and mathematics education. If you've got kids or grandkids, just Google Math Arrow uh, or Kyle Counts. I'm not selling you anything except this. I am selling you on the idea you need to help kids where you live. God shed his grace on thee, but God did not grant children the world's highest standard of living. They're gonna have to earn it. And we're gonna have to give them the tools. Winston Churchill turned to Franklin Roosevelt in World War II and said, give us the tools and we will finish the job. You need to give kids the tools. I don't, you can bake a cake for the bake sale. You can stand behind a counter at the Halloween festival. You can write a big check. You can walk in and say, I'd like to help the teacher correct papers for English or mathematics or give a talk about geography or the convention industry. But we've got to give tools to our children in every country in order for them to prosper and enjoy the standard of living that so many, uh, so many of us have been lucky enough to enjoy. So please do that. And let me, um, let me uh, end uh, in just a moment here with some takeaway on the economy. First of all, my view is inflation is going to behave. Rates, oil, and trade. Rates are going to stay relatively low. Oil is going to likely stay in a comfortable range. And trade, there's a question mark. But if we're right that inflation stays low, rates and oil stay comfortable, then I think the world economy will be grinding higher and in a more prosperous way over the next 12 to 24 months. Choose your partners. That's why you're here. And ask not whether the economy is going to be more prosperous. Ask what you can do to help your city, to help your company, even if the economy is not as strong as it should be. Stay in touch with me. I tweet at econ Todd or, Todd or econtodd.com. Let me close this way. Story about the Florida State Lottery. I'm actually flying to Miami today. The Florida State Lottery was $89 million. Harry goes to church. Harry goes to church and he says, God, I'm a good son, a good neighbor. Please let me win. Nothing. Next week, $237 million. Harry's back at church. God, please, I've been a good son, a good neighbor. I'll volunteer all my time. I'll work in the schools. I'll work on the nothing happens. Next week, $667 million. Harry is back. He's on his knees. He says, God, please let me win. I've been a good son. I've been a good neighbor. There'll be a new wing on the church, a new wing on the school, a new wing on the hospital. Just a, a booming voice from the heavens interrupts. Harry, meet me halfway. At least buy a ticket. <laughs> My point is, I don't care if you're comfortable. I don't care if you've got a big bank account and lots of kids to take care. In the end, we don't just depend on our own children. We depend on the grandchildren and children of people we will, ev we will never meet. We all hold a ticket to this 21st century economy. And we all need to make sure we share the prosperity and share the morals and the standards so that we can have a safe, secure, and prosperous life.